So hello everyone, it's so good to be online or for myself to be in the house of God and you know, we have some people here in this building at Bible says when more than two people are gathered, Christ is in the midst and I'm so really glad I'm not alone with this online celebration and the title is The Climate Crisis. And um, when you read the newspapers, you can read so many things about the pollution, about going green, all those kinds of topics. And I thought about it, how will the world look like in terms of cars? Because that's a big topic, is the electric car like the new normal? And I saw on social media a very smart idea. I think that could be the future for all the cars. And check it out what I saw lately in social media. I don't know, when I, when I saw that, I, I started to laugh because I thought, this is good news if you have a horse at home. If you don't have a horse, you will say, oh my gosh, I have again a problem. If you have an electric car, you need a power, and if you have no, no, no horse, then you have another challenge. I don't know, what is your opinion about going green, the pollution t uh, topic? And I asked Dr. Ruby because we had uh, so many talks around the last couple of years about the pollution, about the going green, and there's a lot of pro and con about that topic and let's hear Dr. Ruby about the different two groups that we have already in society. If I told you that the New York Times published an article on climate change arguing that the world as we know it might be coming to an end, well, no one would probably even blink an eye. However, you might be surprised to learn that this article was published in the New York Times on February 24th 1895. The article suggested countries now basking in the fostering warmth of the tropical sun will give way to the perennial frost and snow of the polar regions. In other words, brace for global cooling. However, in the four decades that followed, average temperatures didn't exactly plummet. If anything, global temperatures warmed slightly. But scientists concluded that this warming was also a catastrophe. On May 15th, 1932, the New York Times reported that unless a stop was put to all this warming, the polar ice caps would melt, which would raise the sea levels and flood the world. However, again, interestingly, in the four decades that followed the 1930s, average temperatures didn't exactly soar. In fact, global temperatures cooled once again. Therefore, on January 11th, 1970, the Washington Post published an article entitled Colder Winters Hell Dawn of New Ice Age. Climatologists who had been studying long-term world weather patterns had found that instead of melting, the Arctic was actually getting colder and polar ice caps were actually increasing in size. The ice caps were growing at such an alarming rate that scientists from different continents started collaborating to find out why. And in July of 1970, the New York Times published the answer. Humans were to blame. As reported in the Washington Post the following year, because of the fine dust that man constantly puts into the atmosphere due to fossil fuel burning, pollution was thought to be blocking out the sun's light. As a result, the earth was predicted to drop in temperature by six degrees. Now, experts in climatology, they all agreed the science was settled. Once the earth's temperature will have dropped by more than five degrees, it would trigger the next ice age. Scientists predicted that the ice age would be upon us by 2020. And by that calculation, there's only a few months left before the year is over. The very prospect of another ice age was literally chilling. And so in January of 1972, 
42 of the top American and European scientists gathered at Brown University in Rhode Island for a crisis summit on global cooling. Immediately following the conference, two of the world's leading climatologists, Dr. Matthews and Dr. Kukla, wrote a letter to the then US President Richard Nixon warning him of the looming ice age that was to come. They said, and I quote, a global deterioration of the climate by order of magnitude larger than any hitherto experienced by civilized mankind is a very real possibility and may be upon us very soon. In other words, the start of the big freeze and the end of the world is at hand, unless, of course, we take urgent action. In response, I believe it's possible, President Nixon said, let the storm rage on, the cold never bothered me anyway. <laughs> Look, when it comes to climate change over the past century or more, I think it's pretty fair to say that scientists have been somewhat hot and cold on the topic. Fortunately, the predictions of the 1970s never came true. However, again, interestingly, in the four decades that followed, rather than temperatures plummeting, average global temperatures warmed once again. However, instead of renewed calm, it brought further alarm. In his 2006 film, An Inconvenient Truth, former US Vice President Al Gore warned the world of global warming. He claimed the world was burning up and as a result of fossil fuel pollution, which interestingly was exactly the same reason given to explain global cooling in the 1970s. He said that unless urgent measures were taken to stop global warming, that we'd be wiped out like the dinosaurs. In essence, you break, you buy, you pollute, you die. In 2006, Time magazine informed the world, be worried, in fact, be very worried. It was claimed that the decades leading up to 2005 were the hottest years on recent record. And if there wasn't urgent global intervention, well, temperatures would continue to rise and life as we know it would cease to be tenable. However, in the decade that followed 2005, the Earth seemed to oscillate between warmer and colder temperatures. So this time, instead of just calling it global warming or global cooling, climatologists modified the name and now forever hereafter refer to this phenomena as climate change. Many scientists now argue that climate change might delay seasons, disrupt weather patterns and increase sea levels. But there are two very different schools of thought on what causes climate change. These two ideologies are deeply divided in their views. One can be characterized by climate alarm, asserting that humans are to blame. Whereas the other can be characterized by climate calm, asserting, look, the climate is always changing. It's natural. Needless to say, climate change has become a very contentious and politically divisive topic. Even in church today, there might be a mix of both climate change activists and climate change skeptics. In fact, some of you might be nervous that we're even talking about this sensitive and highly controversial topic at all, wondering on which side of the fence are we going to fall? Others are probably thinking, hang on, like, what has this got to do with Jesus? Well, I'm glad you asked. In fact, you might be interested to know that Jesus specializes in climate change. In fact, check it out. Mark chapter 4, verse 37 to 39 says, And a furious squall came up and the waves broke over into the boat such that it was nearly swamped. Now, Jesus was asleep in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. So the disciples, they woke him and said to him, Teacher, you don't even care that we're about to drown. So Jesus got up. He rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. And the waves died down and there was complete calm. But then Jesus turned his attention to his disciples and he rebuked them too. You see, Jesus isn't just interested in the external environment in which we live. He's also interested in the internal environment that lives inside of us. In fact, I'd even argue that in this day and age, Jesus is greatly concerned about the melting ice cap of our moral standards. That's why Jesus gives us our very own Kyoto Protocol to avoid a kind of global warming unlike any other, a place 
called hell, where the temperature is said to soar so high that even the water catches fire. Therefore, irrespective of where you stand on the issue of external climate change, Jesus takes our internal climate change very seriously. And that's why today we are talking about managing the meltdown. Hey, Dr. Robbie, thank you so much for sharing the truth. There are actually two groups and two scientists. They argue against each other. And I think for us, the church, is very important to understand what is our position? What does the Bible say about that topic? If you're going to the Bible, right in the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. With other words, God is saying you cannot destroy earth as long as God's hand is upon the earth. I mean, a lot of people say, okay, if this is the case, I don't care anymore about the nature. I don't care about anything anymore, about pollution, the way I live, the way I treat the nature and everything. Oh, this is like a free thing. I can do wherever I want. It's the same thought like people thinking, your name is written in the book of life. That means you are saved forever. You cannot lose salvation anymore. When people hear that topic and say, oh, that, that's good news, Pastor Leo. That means if I'm losing my salvation anymore, I can do whatever I want. I can live whatever I want because I cannot lose my salvation. We don't understand the Bible, the principle, and all the laws are given for us to flourish that the blooming and blossoming and being blessed is the same thought. I play in golf once a week, you know, and the holy of the holies in terms of the golf course is the green. That's the place where you put the golf ball into the hole. This is holy green. You can imagine when you hit the ball far into the air, comes down with the whole speed, creates a hole in the green and gives a backspin because you want to control where the ball is landing. The backspin creates a huge hole in the green. What we do is actually we fix that hole. You know why? Because I want to put smoothly and the next flight who's coming, they want to have a perfect green. What happens if nobody fixes the hole? The golf course will endure. The golf course will still be there. But that means for us, when we want to put, there are holes all over and putting, it's no fun anymore. It's not smooth anymore. And even Tiger Woods has no chance to win a tournament. We have our for me a very important picture of taking care about the laws and the principles of God from heaven. The Bible starts with a commandment in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. And the first commandment is super easy. And there are two others that are a little bit more difficult. God blesses them and said to them, be fruitful. That's easy. That's the easy part. And increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish, the sea, and the birds in the sky, and over the living creature that moves on ground. Hey, when you read that Bible verse, that two words, it hit me in the beginning, seduce it and rule over. Often people think, I can rule over the animals. I am the king and the animals somewhere here. But if you're going into the Hebrew language and you understand the Hebrew language has here two words. Here, for example, seduce it and the word rule over. Those two words in the Hebrew language means actually kabaj and rada. Kabaj and rada in the Hebrew meaning gives us an understanding what God is actually saying to the local church, to all the followers of God, what kabaj and rada actually means. The word kabaj means take something under your feet, like the work of a gardener who blesses the earth by working on it. God is saying, I gave you the earth, the planet. Be like a gardener, not rubbish, not destroying the forest and the sea and the pollution. 
when God is entrusting us heaven and earth, God is saying, I trust you, you like a gardener. And the second thing of Rabbah actually means in the Hebrew meaning to protect and carry wandering of the shepherd with his flock. That means I take care about the animals like, like a shepherd cares for a sheep. And this means we are friendly to animals, we protect them, we take care because God is saying, I gave you earth, be a gardener, and I gave you animals, take care for the creations of God. Now comes the question, why in a flipping world we're robbing this earth, destroying the earth, and why we're not friendly with animals? And Tobias Teichen from ICF Munich, he gives us the answer, and there's one specific thing who blocks us to be friendly and nice to creation. Thank you, Pastor Leo, for this introduction. So we have this principle of Kabash and Rada, and it means that God created us in his image. So this means that God's, God's character is that he looks after his uh, creation like a shepherd or like a gardener, and he gives us the responsibility to make it like him. And so the question is, why don't we do it? Why don't we uh, act in our world how he designed us to do? Because I think that things in us like... Uh, uh, um, creed or ego, it's about our ego. So we think about ourselves. So we think, why should I do this? Why should I uh, uh, save the, the, the planet or something like this? And it's like when you have a rental car, I don't know how you use a rental car. When I have a rental car, car to be honest, I drive a little bit different than uh, my own car. For example, I drive a little bit faster. So uh, I don't uh, think so much about the wheels when I go in the brakes or start. So it's not so much about the things around me because it's it's rental, I give it back, and it's not so clean as my car, maybe, because I have, uh, in, in my contract, I have always with cleaning, so I don't have to clean it. So I act in this car because it's not mine, like the guy I have. A Thank you, Pastor Leo, for bringing it back like this with all the plastic. And I think we act in a way in our, in our world, in our, with our planet, like it's not up. Thank you, Pastor Leo, for us. It's ours. We are responsible. We are the stewards of this planet. So it's ours. We are responsible for this. One day God will ask us when we stand before him, how, how, what kind of steward have you been? And it's also about his creation. So the second thing is not only like a rental car, so we sometimes act like it's like a, uh, like a toilet in, in, the, in the main station of the train station. So in Germany, these uh, toilets are very bad, very dirty. And sometimes we act like this. When I have to go in this toilet, it's like, oh, it's ugly. I don't want to go there. I go out fast, but I won't clean because it's not mine. I have to go out fast. And we act with our, with our planet like this, like a toilet who is already dirty and I don't help to clean. So it's my planet. What does it mean? When I, when, I, when I walk at the ocean and there's plastic in it, when it's my world, what should, what should I do? I take the plastic with me. When it's your world, I let it there, like the toilet in the main station. So God gives us principle. And so Crete leads to bad treatment of God's animals. Uh, we have a principle in Deuteronomy 25. There's do not muscle on ox while it is treating out the grain. So the people, because of their ego, they had an idea. They thought when the ox is in the crane, uh, we, we, we fix his mouth that he can't eat out of the crane. So it means that uh, they, they took everything out of this animal without uh, treating him well. And God is telling him, he's like in your team. This animal is not something separated from you. It's like in your team. It's like treat him like a team member. He has to eat good, drink good, and be treated good. Then you can be like a team with the animals. So this is one point. The other point is uh, the animals are important to God. In Genesis 9.9, 9, it's uh, now established my covenant. And God is telling us that his covenant is not only with the human being. It's only uh, as well with all uh, the animals. In John 3.16, is another uh, uh, hint for us. It is God so loved the world and that he give, gave his only son. If you know uh, Jesus already, maybe you know this verse already. The interesting thing is when in Greek it's about the world, it's the word cosmos. And cosmos means the whole universe. It's with all the animals, with the planet and the human being. And the Bible is telling us that God loved all this, all this whole package together. 
So the question is, how can I act like this? For example, if I eat cheap meat, I can't say oh, I'm not responsible, so I have not much money, so I eat cheap meat. No, when I eat cheap meat, it means I support this industry. I support a way to treating animals in a bad way, and I'm responsible for my things I'm doing. So it's like a balancing act. It's not like worshipping animals in some other religions. It's like supporting them well and treating them well. In Proverbs 12.20, it's like good people are kind to their animals, but a mean person is cruel. So it's about if you're with God, we should act good, the animals. Greed leads to bad treatment to land and nature. So as well, because of the greed, we want to take everything out of the land. In uh, Exodus 23, there's a principle for, from God. For six years, you are to sow your fields and harvest the crops. But during the seventh year, let the land lie unployed and unused. So God is giving this principle and is telling me every seventh years, we should leave the land unused. So we have a fight in us and he's thinking like, it can't be. When I let the land unused for one year, every seventh year, what's with me? I don't have so much income. I don't, will I survive? But it's like trusting in God that he will bless you if you, when you treat his nature in his will and his land in his will. It's like if you start tithing. When you start tithing, you think it's impossible to give 10%. If I give it, I don't have enough. But God is telling you, if you're a steward, if you start tithing, you will be blessed. The same is with the country, with the landscape. If you treat it well, if you don't take everything out of it as you can, you will be blessed from God in a supernatural way. So the problem is, because of greed, uh, it leads to pollution of water because it's expensive uh, to make it in a good way. Greed leads to air pollution because it's expensive to save the air because then I have to invest money in my company to save The air, because it's my air, remember, it's my ocean, it's my planet. That's why I act in a different way. Greed leads to a uh, uh, shortage of raw materials. So we, we kill all the woods without thinking on tomorrow. Greed leads to water shortage. So the question is now, how can I re really act in a very practical way? Because it's sometimes overwhelming when we see all the things. And Pastor Leo will tell us in one ex with one example how can we be really practical in this topic. Hey, thank you so much, Pastor Tobias, for sharing us this thought. And I really believe, can you imagine God is saying, I'm entrusting you this earth, the whole planet, the whole cosmos, everything that God has created. He's the creator. He has done everything perfectly. And he said, you are in the position, church, people of God, you are like a gardener. You're doing something out of the garden. You make it more beautiful than I gave it to you. And the second thing, God is saying, all the animals I have given to you, you like a shepherd, you take care in respect and responsible to all the animals that I've given to you. I think the key why we're not are disrespectful is greed. We are so greedy and we want everything for me, myself and I and we're not thinking in terms of I am blessed to be a blessing and I want to hand over this earth, this cosmos to the next generation. And God is always a generation God. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And I am here to be a blessing for the next generation generation. My point I want to love to share with you guys is greed leads to expensive consumption. What I mean by consumption? There is a statistic that says all the stuff you bought in the last six months, 99% of all the stuff you bought, you are not using those stuff. That means only 1% of what you bought you are using. That's why we have a big garage. Everyone has a room where you have old stuff, but you don't use it anymore. And why in the flipping world we are not sharing those things with people or giving to people in need? It doesn't make sense to add stuff in our apartments, in our houses we're not using. And Jesus is saying in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life doesn't consist on abundance of possessions. About two or three years ago, my wife, she, she came up to me and said, Honey, 
I think minimalistic lifestyle, there's something godly in that. She said, we have too many stuff and we're adding stuff and stuff. We're buying things. We're not using that after six months anymore. And we went into a, in a, into a season where we gave away so many things, trousers and jeans and pullovers and shoes and money and so on and on and on and on. Because I realized I have from everything too much. For example, I had 30 jeans, maybe 20 different shoes. I had maybe 15 different uh, sport t-shirts. But the thing is, I only in using maybe four t-shirts because we have a washing machine. And we went, entered the lifestyle, minimalistic lifestyle to have less. But what we have, the thinking, where we buy the jeans or why, where we buy the meat or what we buy, where and when. And here is like behind the scenes of my cupboard, I want to take you into my apartment that you see I reduced to the minimum in my life. Behind the scenes, here is my minimalistic lifestyle, black t-shirts and white t-shirts and some others. And here all the shirts for doing sport. And check this out here are some shoes, there are not many, some jeans, some jackets, and here all the leather jackets that I use for preaching and teaching and here Check this out, Adidas number one, number two, number three, and here is my number four. And I really love this uh, minimalistic lifestyle because it's simple, it's less, but more beautiful. Hey, people, I, I don't want to be a missionary of going less or minimalistic lifestyle, you know, but just I want to share with you guys what you do in the outside, in the physical realm has also an application into the spirit because of giving things away, of having less. That means we save some money. I'm not a big shopper anymore. And my wife said to me, look, honey, be honest. When you preach with a, with a jeans, a black t-shirt and a leather jacket, it looks just awesome. This is the, the way you, you look really strong and cool and just keep simplicity. Simplicity is not always simple, but this is for me, like a lifestyle because I really believe we have too much stuff in our Western communities. And the last point I would love to share with you guys, greed leads to food waste. I want to be honest with you guys. I grew up in a, in a, in a my parents have been farmer and I grew up of planting and see, uh, 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 sowing and reaping, yeah, sowing and reaping, and I learned everything about harvest and sowing and reaping. And my parents told me, we will only buy what we need and we cook what we are able to eat. And in my whole 50 years, we never kicked food away. Maybe you are from America or other nations, you're like, oh my gosh, really? Never. Because I really believe, I believe in my deepest my heart, I respect even earth. I respect even what the farmer does. If I'm buying stuff, kicking stuff away, that means I losing money and they producing more and more and more. And this is like a circle of a never ending story. And here's good news. Even our boys, they following our footsteps and they're doing the same stuff. And here is the story of my youngest son, Stephen. Hi there, my name is Steven and today I want to tell you what it means for me to be a good manager of resource. My parents already taught me as a child that I should not waste my food and that I should always eat it up. And today I still live according to these principles. And I want to give you two examples where I do that in my life. The first example is bread. I eat every breakfast some slice of bread and this creates always some leftovers. And I try to store the bread in a way that it doesn't dry out so that I can eat it in the next morning. And the second example is pasta. I cook pasta several times a week and I always wait before I cook it. And in that way, I don't create any leftovers, which I would have to throw away or eat up. And with these two examples, I wanted to show you what it means for me to be a good manager of the resource food. Hey people, that's just two examples how I do it. I started off minimalistic lifestyle is one thing. I have too many stuff in my life and I think it's very important to reduce the stuff. 
And the second thing, I think we should respect even though food and food waste, it doesn't make sense because there's a lot of people, they're starving, they are going to bed and they have nothing to eat. And I really believe we have to start somewhere. And the whole Friday future, Friday for future, I think there's something godly in that, in that movement. I don't say everything is godly, but there's something sweet in it that people say, hey, come on, God has given us this planet Earth. Of course, we cannot destroy it. This is what the Bible says. But still, I'm a gardener. And I want to create the garden in a more beautiful way than I got the garden. And the second thing, I would love to treat the animals with respect because I'm thinking for the next generation. The band is uh, singing a song from a song about the, if the nature is praising and worshiping the name of Jesus Christ. Hey, who we are. And I think I'm in the position to say, God, I'm blessed to be a blessing. You have given me so much stuff. And if everything you have given me and the whole nature is praising the beautiful name of God, He is the creator of everything and anything. Thank you so much, Gloria, for this amazing song. Wow, I love that song because it brings everything on the point. Hey, I don't know how what is this topic is for you guys, but for me, actually, I love the idea that God has entrusted us heaven and earth. We are like a gardener. We are like a shepherd. We take care for the whole environment, for all the animals in a way that God takes care for these animals and for, for everything that God has given us on planet Earth. I would love to close with this Bible verse in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. God blesses them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill this earth and subdue it, kabash, like a gardener. Rule over Radha means like a shepherd who takes care for the flock. In the fish, in the sea, in the birds, in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on ground. And we heard in the message the reason why we are disrespectful is the word greed. Greed means I have a longing if I buy something, it creates like this hormone, this feeling, I deserve it. It does something in my soul, but it does not last forever. And the Bible is clear about it, that Jesus Christ is the source of all the joy. He's the source of happiness, not the stuff I buy, or even though if not friendly to animals. And I think we have to start somewhere. We, we cannot do everything, but if everyone is doing at least one thing, we can change the environment and hand it over to the next generation. And it's blessed because we have been blessed from God Almighty. Hey, I would love to close the message. I want to invite the Holy Spirit because the Bible says He leads us. He's our teacher in all areas of life. Because the Holy Spirit spoke to the, the church, the seven churches. And the Bible says, hear and listen like a sheep what the Spirit of God wants to say to you. And let's ask together the Holy Spirit to give you right now a revelation where and how you can start of being a blessing like a gardener, like a shepherd for the animals and for the whole world. Holy Spirit, here am I. And I love the way you are my teacher. You are my, my inspiration. You're the one who gives me like an insight what is on God's heart. And God, I, I, I'm, I'm in the position to follow you I submit my whole entire life into your hands. And please speak to me, Holy Spirit, in which area I could do a change, in which area I can start of being more like a gardener or like a shepherd. Can we be just quiet for a moment because I believe in that moment where we give the Holy Spirit just that room you know, the Spirit of God speaks to those people. They give Him room. And wherever you are, be like a sheep. Just listen. 
that the Spirit of God, He wants to speak to you. Hey church, the Holy Spirit spoke to me around two years ago about my minimalistic lifestyle and the effect in my spirit, in my daily walk with Christ has and had a tremendous impact because I feel more like living a simplicity lifestyle of being more aware. I'm already blessed from God Almighty and the joy is not in buying stuff and adding stuff more in sharing, giving, reducing, and using this planet as a gardener, as a shepherd. Hey, what I love about when the Holy Spirit speaks, don't be shocked. Be shocked when God is not speaking to you anymore. That means God is saying, I'm done. It doesn't make sense anymore that I speak to you. But sometimes people say to me, I don't like it. The Holy Spirit is always changing me, challenging me. See, that's good news. He's not done with you. He's not finished with you. God is still in the move. God is still doing something amazing in your life. That means God is with you in the move. And you are in the position that God is using you as a gardener, as a shepherd to bless this earth and hand it over to the next generation. Hey, can we stand for a moment and praise God with worship songs? And worship song is for me like lifting my eyes to the Creator. God has created the heaven and the earth in such a beautiful way. He entrusted us everything and He believed in us that we are smart, that we are good stewards. And we are in the position of being the best steward that God is able to find on this planet earth let's praise the creator who created us so many things in such a beautiful and awesome way let's praise the name of jesus christ come on